a kind of professional short sharp shock read we always say that the TLC acronym was accidental it's actually tough loving care most of the time uh, we also offer mentoring which is a kind of more in-depth more intensive process over 12 to 18 months to help writers finishing a book project whether that be a novel a memoir a short story collection or a poetry collection and we also run a series of literary events everything from a big conference that we hosted in 2012 the first to bring kind of industry and writers into one room all the way through to smaller workshops craft based workshops and even interdisciplinary um, things bringing for example poetry and music together or bringing drama and prose together those sorts of things we are part arts Council England funded and as part of that remit we have a responsibility to think of the wider writing ecology at large and we run something called the quality writing for all campaign and the quality writing for all campaign means that all the work that we do we try and think about outreach opportunities to make sure that those who are underserved and marginalized by the publishing industry have opportunities and as such we have about 100 bursaries available every year to low-income and otherwise marginalized writers and writing east midlands is one of our partners on the free reads scheme which offers those bursaries so if you are a low-income writer looking for help please visit the website please look at the free reads scheme and we have lots of links to other organizations we're very much about facilitating uh, so these are just a few of our success stories i say success stories carefully because Part of this session, uh, I know it's called preparing your manuscript for publication, but actually part of this session is trying to understand that what I'm interested in and what TLC is interested in is uh, pathways to readership. That's what we prefer to call it, because publication is not the be all and end all for writers, and I don't think it should be. Nevertheless, uh, we do facilitate uh, publishing contracts for and have, have managed to put writers in touch with agents and publishers over the years. Um, about 12,500 writers have come through our services so far and of those hundreds have been published. You can see already a hint of the ratio there. There's just a selection of some of the writers that we've helped get published. Um, for anyone who is visually impaired or not able to see the screen, this is just a collection of cover artwork from some of the writers we have helped, including Winnie M. Lee, who came through the Free Read scheme herself, um, Kelly Greenberg, Jeff got long listed for the Women's Prize, Memory Songs, James Cook and his uh, music memoir, Jimmy Tender Flaar with his collection of short stories, um, and the amazing activist and writer Penny Pepper with her memoir, First in the World Somewhere. Um, Sex, Drugs, Rock and Roll and Disability. So this is just a, a selection. Um, we also run something called Being a Writer, which is the only online platform for writers which is focused on creativity and resilience. So instead of how to get published, which I, there are a million how to get published courses, we run courses on how to uh, face self-doubt, break through writer, a writer's block and make time and space for your writing when you feel like you don't have time and space. So the session today um, will be split into three parts and for each of these again if you have questions or anything that needs further detail or clarification please do just leave a, a comment in the chat but we'll be looking at finishing the book editing the book and pitching the book and whilst at TLC we we work across genres and formats anything from uh, novels poetry short stories scripts uh, children's illustrated fiction um, here Primarily, I'll be talking about fiction and creative nonfiction aimed at a commercial market. But again, if you have questions about other types of work, um, please pop those in the chat. So the first section here then, it's on finishing the book. Um, why is this important if we're thinking about publication and preparing for publication? Uh, one, you need to know where you are in the writing process to understand whether publication is your end goal. Understanding your end goal is extremely important. Um, and two, if you are writing fiction, if you're writing a novel, most agents will not accept uh, a submission from you unless the book is complete. The manuscript will need to be complete. They will normally look at opening chapters and if they like them, they will call in the rest of the book. 
So you'll be very stuck if they call in the rest of the book and you think, my God, I've got to write another 60,000 words. So as I said, where are you in the writing journey? Um, really, when you're finishing the book, it's about understanding where you are. And um, Paper Nations, which is a brilliant creative writing incubator, has a, uh, they've, they've designed something or they've created something called the Writer's Cycle. You can go and Google this, Paper Nations, the Writer's Cycle, and find out a bit more. But in terms of trying to situate yourself and where you are in the writing process with this project that you're currently working on, um, I found this a really, really helpful tool. So the Writer's Cycle works on the basis that, um, as it says on the screen, and that for anyone, again, visually impaired, I'll read out what is on the screen, um, circulating around the writer are the core habits of writing practice, which are defined by the Writer's Cycle as write and explore. And these are depicted as two sort of satellites in orbit around the writer with the idea that actually no writing journey is linear and that at any point you could be switching between the two but generally you'll either be writing or exploring so i suppose it might be a useful time for you to have a think at the moment with your writing project are you in the writing stage or the exploration stage or perhaps a bit of both in the writer's cycle I'll read this bit off the screen again. Writers write and explore in a variety of different contexts or themes. These, there are four key themes here as defined by the writer's cycle. And again, it might be useful just looking at this to think which one of these most applies to where you are. The four as defined by the writer's cycle are discovery, connection, craft, and transformation. So if, if any, which of those speak to you? Have a think uh, with, with the writing project you're looking at right now. The quote goes on, importantly, writing is not presented as a linear process or as stages of attainment. Every writer's experience of writing is different depending on their own circumstances, inclinations and interest. I think that's really key. Um, we at TLC, on the front page of our website, www.literaryconsultancy.co.uk, have something similar, which we call the Writer's Journey Wizard. I'm, I'm told the word wizard means something in, in computer speak, which is, <laughs> which is why it's called the Writer's Journey Wizard. But effectively, the wizard is just a tool to define four areas uh, as we see them in, in our writer's cycle, based on the, the clients that we work with. We see these four areas and again have a think to yourself where am i which one most applies to where i am um, we see these as four stages the first uh, and first is almost a, fal a falsehood because again it's not linear but one of the stages is exploring ideas or planning so you might be in the early stages of a writing project you have a plan outline a notebook full of ideas some scenes written perhaps you might have a couple of chapters or you know a summary Another stage here is write the writing stage. So you're actively working on a first draft where you're starting to piece the narrative elements together. And I know that previously there was a session on narrative and uh, narrative structure. So I hope that helps you in that in that regard. So these are the first two exploring ideas and planning and writing a book. The second two are finishing a book. So almost at the finishing line with a writing project, but you're working closely to it and perhaps you can't quite see the wood for the trees. And you might have attended some workshops, feel like you're generally on track, you know where you're going. And this final stage, and again, you might drift between the stages. If you have finished, you are finished. You have a draft, you might have a first draft, a fifth draft, or a tenth draft. And it might not be quite what you want it to be, but it's done, it's complete. And you've been working on it for a while. So again, just to show those four stages as we see them exploring ideas and planning writing, finishing, and finished. So again, just have a think, well, which of those stages are you in currently with the book that you're looking at and preparing for publication and or something else? So we're moving on to the second section of this uh, session, which is editing. Now this is the bread and butter of what TLC does. We are an editorial consultancy. And so I have prepared, firstly, a few quotes, which I thought were quite fun and that I share sometimes. Um, 
This one is from the American writer Bernard Malamud. He says, first drafts are for learning what your novel is about. Revision is working with that knowledge to enlarge and enhance an idea, to reform it. I think that's a lovely way of looking at the editing stage. And the distinction here between first drafts and revision, or what, what some writers even call a zero draft. The effort draft, I don't know whether I'm permitted to swear, so I shan't, but the effort draft is the kind of just get it down on the page. Then you can do your first draft. Sometimes that gives you a bit of a loosening up in your mind so you're able to just get to the finish line. This from one of my favourite writers, the French writer Sidonie Gabriel Collette, who says, put down everything that comes into your head and then you're a writer. But an author is one who can judge his or her own stuff's worth without pity and destroy most of it. I feel like that should have a little bit in brackets, if necessary. <laughs> you don't have to burn all your writing down just to prove that you can. But I think you need to show a little bit of willingness. And this from the Irish Italian author, E.A. Bucchianeri, who and she says, the book is more important, this is critical, I think, the book is more important than your plans for it. So I know this session is about publication, but actually you need to be thinking about what the book needs. You have to go with what works for the book, she says. Don't whine when things are not going your way because they are going right the right way for the book, which is more important. The show must go on and so must the book. Slightly, slightly self-important. My apologies to EA Bookinary if she's out there. Um, but I think it's a, a relevant sentiment because you need to start detaching yourself from being the writer and start trying dispassionately to view the book as a reader when you're preparing it for publication. And in order to prepare it, you will be presumably self-editing. And I have created this little um, self-editing checklist, which we like to share um, at things like this, which I am sharing here. Our self-editing checklist um, has these one, two, three, four, five, six things that we think you need to have. The first is self-awareness. So as we were talking about before, where you are in your writing journey, but also a little bit of awareness of perhaps where you are in your writing level, what feels realistic for you to be reaching for, what you think you might be looking for, for this book. Resilience. It's extremely tough out there, and I will, um, in, a, in the later, the third bit of this presentation, share a few statistics with you that I've obtained. Uh, not because it's a scary, horrible thing, but because I think it's worth us arming ourselves with knowledge. Objectivity, as I said before, you're a writer, but at some point you need to begin to think like a reader in order to prepare yourself for pitching yourself or uh, for for publication or whatever that might be. Kindness, be kind to yourself. It's a huge achievement and it's, uh, it's a scary thing to be doing. And it's also one of those odd things that everyone thinks they can do and yet very few people break through with. Um, you know, nobody picks up a violin and says, do you know what, I'm just going to become a virtuoso. And yet people pick up a pen and say, I reckon I could become a published novelist. And I think more power to them, but, um, but remember, always to be kind to yourself in that process. There's a lot of competition, a lot of strangeness, which we won't talk about in this session. Um, so be kind to yourself. Curiosity, be open to things changing, um, whether that be your writing or your writing goals. I think this is also important. And a little bit of discipline, I think, is part of this self-editing checklist as well. Um, you know, habits, uh, habit forming, there's a whole science to habit forming. Um, and when we talk about writing, we talk about, you know, you should write so and so many words a day. I sort of think it's a bit of nonsense. No one writes in one particular way. On the other hand, you can form the discipline of saying, I am going to carve out this part of my day for writing. And it might not be 500 words, but it might be 20 minutes. And if in that 20 minutes you're really productive, great. If in that 20 minutes you produce two words, you have at least sat down for that 20 minutes. So it's about shifting those metrics a little bit. Um, and also with self-editing, understand that you will not need to necessarily be in the same frame of mind for editing as you will for writing. 
So just be aware of what time of day do you feel kind of more editing minded. It sounds a bit silly, but actually you might realise that you feel super creative in the mornings. Do some writing, do something new. And in the evenings you feel a bit more um, objective and you think, OK, I can I can do some editing for a bit. Just going to share here our um, top editing tips based on 25 years of work with writers and, and also based on conversations that we've had with our professional editors. So we have 90 professional readers on our list at TLC um, and we've talked to them and we've come up with this list based on their work with writers for us and our work with the writing community. Um, this will all be shared. It's also, I think, being recorded, um, but I'm happy to also share these with you as slides separately. So our first top editing tip, uh, I've said this before, but it, it becomes a rule here, it becomes a tip. Be kind. If this is your first draft, don't be hard on yourself. You've done brilliantly to complete a book at all. Genuinely, I, my hat's off to you. The second tip, um, we come across this a lot. Read it aloud. Reading your text aloud will help you scan your writing for rhythm, sense and authenticity and for repetition. Um, and what I mean by that is the eye can skip over things that are repeated because the brain is only looking for, uh, you know, a number of words that might be the same within a sentence. It might not be looking for the same rhythm of a sentence repeated or the same, the same trope repeated. <clears throat> Reading aloud can pick up those other repetitions. If something sounds strange when you read it aloud or if you find yourself stumbling over it when you read it, it probably needs cutting or editing. Uh, tip three, beware exposition. Another common, common pitfall for writers is including long sections of exposition, particularly at the opening of a book. And remember, the opening is what you are sending to a literary agent. So this is where you need to wow them instead of doing what, what some people call authorial throat clearing. So you're sort of setting your stall out when, when probably in the early stages of writing you needed to do that. But when you're editing, see what happens when you just cut that first page away. What have you lost? Um, this is part of the age old show don't tell writing rule. Um, I'm not a fan of writing rules. We, we could talk about this in, in the chat if you'd like. <laughs> I, I think they can be a bit tyrannical. They're also uh, incredibly based on Western tropes around what it means to write. Um, however, this, uh, I like this, this iteration of it um, through this Chekhov quote that I share a lot. It says, don't tell me the moon is shining. Show me the glint of light on broken glass. Um, tip four, don't start late, don't end early. So many of the books we see at TLC and we see about, I don't know, 500 to 600 a year probably, um, start too late and end too early. Analyze the beginning of your book. Do you really need that first page, that prologue, that backstory? Did you need it at the beginning of the writing process? And is it still relevant and necessary now? Five, I learned this the hard way because um, I do it myself. Look out for pet words. Every writer has a word like this. Unusual words that they want to show off. <laughs> Uh, firstly, check you're using them correctly if they are they are fancy words. Always keep a good dictionary handy. And secondly, if it's a very unusual word, use the search function, control F in Word, to make sure you don't use it more than twice in a book. If it's particularly unusual, readers will notice. I've noticed a lot, for instance, um, in, in recent literary fiction, ministrations appears everywhere all the time. And I don't know whether it's just that I've started noticing it or whether it's always been there. Um, or certain certain writers, I, I mean, I'm one of those terrible people who underlines things in books, but I'm always noticing things like this. Tip six, screen for cliche. We, oh, I'm sorry, my font seems to have changed on the screen there, but hopefully that doesn't ruin the presentation for you. Screen for cliches, we all know what cliches look like, from phrases to character types and tropes. Um, find new ways of saying and of describing. Clichés are tricky and there could be a whole presentation just on cliché because we know uh, the phrases that are clichéd and hackneyed, but tropes, archetypes and stereotypes are more insidious kinds of cliché that creep in and are um, just as easily weeded out if you know how to spot them. Tip seven, check your facts. So what I mean by that is cross-reference your dates, locations and events. 
pick out any anachronisms. Your readers will notice if you're writing a contemporary political thriller and you've got your politicians mixed up, or if your historical fiction character uses a phrase that wasn't invented to 100 years after the time in which your novel is set. I had a friend at my postgraduate course um, 11 years ago now who was writing about corridors in a, in a historical novel and discovered that they weren't invented. I had no idea that corridors were even invented. They hadn't been invented at the time her novel was set, so she had to go back and erase the corridors from the manuscript. Tip number eight, learn the distance technique. This again comes from one of our readers, which I find really helpful. There are, so there are three distances that she's defined. Long distance, which means the genre that you're working in, e.g. Um, thriller or crime or romance. The market, so for instance, if it's crime, um, hard world detective story um, or upmarket women's commercial fiction or whatever it might be. The story arc, the overall, the overall story arc and character development. So that's long distance. Then you have middle distance. That's chapter structure, balance, overall voice and beginnings, middles and endings. So have a look at those. And then you do the close up. So the idea is it's almost like a camera moving from further away to closer in. The third, third round of, of editing would be close up. So sentence construction, language consistency, spelling, formatting, grammar. And tip nine, check your story for sense and logic. It might help to make a timeline for your book. Separate out your plots and your subplots for a clearer idea of how they fit together. Make sure the character's goals are consistent. So each of your characters will have a goal or each of your characters will have something they want, even if it is just a glass of water. Brownie points for anyone in the audience who knows who that quote is by. So make sure the character's goals are consistent and that their reactions are logical, believable and in character. And the final of our top editing tips here is summarise. So um, this is a this is one of mine that I use actually. Um, it helps to put longer projects into focus. And how I do it is write the content of each chapter into one paragraph. Then narrow this down so each of those paragraphs will become one sentence. Now line your sentences in order. So write them each one after the other. How does it read when you read those sentences? It will read a little bit garbled, it won't read like a beautiful end-to-end -end story, but what's quite interesting about this technique is it will really show you things around pacing, it will show you things around consistency, and it will show you if you've grouped together information that's very samey in one part of your book. So splitting things into uh, chapters into a paragraph summary, paragraph summary into a sentence, line the sentences up in order, read them. How does it feel? So to summarise the, uh, the editing part of this before we move on to the pitching part, um, if you do just three things, obviously you, you would, you know, if you're, if you're being super diligent, you will do all of the things I've just <laughs> described and check for absolutely everything. But if you remember just three things from this, from the editing section, it's these three buzzwords, um, each of which, uh, just on screen I have three words, beside which is a green tick for each of the words. And those three words are interrogate, clarify, polish. By which I mean interrogate, interrogate your writing. Ask questions of it. Is it holding up under interrogation? If you say, why does this section need to be here? And you have an answer, well, actually it needs to be there because of this. And you think, yes, I'm happy with that answer, great. If it doesn't quite hold up, interrogate, interrogate again. Clarify, make sure everything is clear. Even if it's complicated, it's clear. And polish, that last final polish, that's the sort of making it gleam part. That's the brushing up your, your grammar and your syntax. Um, and if anyone has questions about professional editing in sort of copy editing and, and proofreading, please, I haven't included that here. Um, but do include your questions in the chat if you have any about that. I can also 
answer those. Um, although in brief, do you need a professional proofread before you send to agents and publishers? No. Um, should you get a professional read, like with TLC, entirely up to you. It is not necessary, um, but it might be helpful depending on where you are in that writing process. And finally, before we get to your questions, and I hope I hope they're accumulating, um, the third part of preparing your manuscript for publication. So we've thought about where we are in the writing journey, what our kind of goals are generally. We've thought about finishing the book, completing it, making sure that we've interrogated it, clarified, polished, and we've done the editing. We've edited it to within an inch of its life and it's ready to go, and we're now thinking of pitching it, which means sending it to literary agents or publishers, generally to literary agents, um, but you can submit directly to some publishers. <clears throat> so, what, I mean, what is this idea of pitching? What is a pitch? What are we doing when we're pitching to um, agents? I, uh, you, you may already have a session on specific kind of submissions to agents, so I've kept this very general, but if anyone has specific questions about the agent pitch, I'm really happy to answer those. So, pitch in general, what is it? We're thinking about these things, so this is a list of bullet points on screen, um, and I will, I will share them with you and read them out so you're not missing anything if you're not seeing it. Um, the first of these is, what is the title, genre and word count? So in any pitch, you should be thinking about these things. What is your title, genre and word count? So basically, up front and centre, they know what, what it's called, who it's by, obviously you, um, make sure that's not separate, the genre that you're working in, because this signals to agents and publishers how they will sell it and to whom they are selling it, and your word count. Word count um, generally can be very flexible, but uh, for children's fiction, extremely narrow bands according to which age group. So you, again, may have had a session on this already, but if you have specific questions on word count, please put them in the chat. <clears throat> what is the setting? So where are we? Who is the protagonist or protagonists? What is at stake? And what happens to overcome conflict and find resolution. Um, we work with a, a wonderful writer called Jacob Ross, who is one of our advisors and also a long-standing TLC reader and mentor. And his um, he he does fantastic lectures on on structure, narratology, and his idea about resolution. He said it's not really about finding an ending so much as it is making sure you come to a point of rest, which I really love. So these are the things to be thinking about in your pitch. Now let's hone in. <clears throat> okay, so you're thinking about all of those things, but how do you structure them? Now this is just uh, my idea of you starting a template. I do want to make it clear this is just my version of how I would suggest structuring a pitch. There may be other ways to do this, there will be other ways to do this, and you can do it any which way you want. Um, but this is an exercise I sometimes set which can be very handy to try and give yourself a, a template to start if you think, I don't know where I'm starting, what I'm doing. So here's my suggested template. I suggest that you start with a three sentence summary of the book project in hand. Why three sentences? You might be thinking, my god, I can't possibly summarise my glorious book in just three sentences. It's about so much more than three sentences can ever encompass. However, when you think about an agent talking to an editor and trying to sell the book on a phone call over a publishing lunch or whatever it might be, they're going to have to start with something that really is pithy and punchy and sums it up. And um, uh, somebody recently actually said something in, a, in at a conference, I think. I, can't, I really can't remember who it was. I think it might be someone in the audience who said, we're really good at talking about other people's books. So, you know, if you love a book, you can sum it up easily in three sentences. Think about books that you recommend to friends warmly. You will automatically reach for two or three sentences. But we find it difficult to do it with our own. So if you can do it, you've recommended books before to other people, you can absolutely do it with your own. So start with your three sentence summary. Then add a paragraph of synopsis, so a paragraph of what's happening in the book. Again, a paragraph sounds really tiny. There's a reason I say a paragraph, because again, you want distillation, you want concision, you want precision. Um, and if anybody wants an, another link, um, I haven't included it here because it's a whole blog post, but on the TLC website, we have something called the Writer's Corner, 
We've got loads of resources, blogs, etc. And in the blog, there is a how to write a synopsis page that I've written, um, which has uh, much more detail on that synopsis. Then include some additional information. So why this book? Why now? Why you? So that will give you a page of a pitch and you can finesse it, you can add to it, you can fiddle around with it, you can judge it, judge it up. But as a general template, three sentence summary, bit of synopsis, and then an additional little bit about why this book, why now, why you. And a pitch I've put at the bottom here is for an agent, for a publisher, and for readers. That's why it's critical now to understand how you pitch your work, because everybody involved in that book production process will be pitching your book down the line. Your agent to an editor, the editor to their sales team, um, you know, or if it's a junior editor to their commissioning editor or acquiring editor or senior editor, um, and to the whole publishing team, to marketing and publicity, to bookshops, to distributors. That pitching happens all the way down the line. So you need to be good at doing it. And um, I don't know if any people, any of you are thinking about self-publishing. Um, but this applies even if you're considering self-publishing, because when you pitch yourself, um, if you want to make a professional impression, you're going to be you're going to have to think about where you sell the book. Um, and so I found, uh, you know, I was looking at kind of bookseller pitches. What would it, what would a bookseller want? The Alliance of Independent Authors has a, a great uh, resource for self-publishing authors, including things like how to pitch to bookshops, and exactly kind of you know templates and uh, of AI's um, advanced information sheets. But here's a summary based on the Booksellers Association guide on a bookseller pitch. In case relevant to anybody here in the room, they're looking for a two to three sentence synopsis, a couple of lines about who you are or who the writer is, sales details, so that'll be retail price, terms of business, information on discounts, format, uh, what kind of format, paperback, hardback, etc. Uh, barcode, EAN, returns policy, time scale for keeping stock. If you don't know any of this terminology, don't worry. I'm just including it here in case there is anybody out there thinking, actually, I do want to think about pitches to booksellers. And you can find more on the Booksellers Association guide. Um, and a bookshop will also want sample pages, cover artwork. As a JPEG, that's just an image file format. Um, they want to hear why, they, why you think the book will sell in this bookshop and a bit of market information. And to those of you who are thinking this isn't relevant, it's just showing you that actually at every point down the line that pitching is happening. And um, again, at, just as we summarise the editing with those three things that you want to do, interrogate, clarify and polish, um, these are the three things that when you're pitching, I ask writers to, to keep in mind. Um, I've asked, uh, and often this can be your three sentences. If you're struggling with how do I do a three sentence summary, try and answer these three questions. What is happening? To whom? And why should we care? That sounds like a rather rude question, why should we care? But thematically, what are we engaging with? What is at stake? What are we investing in? That's the why should we care? So just make a little note of what those questions are and have a think about whether you can answer them for your book, for the thing that you're writing at the moment. What is happening in the book? To whom? Why should we care? If you have answered those questions, you're, on, you're well on your way to a perfect pitch. And in terms of where you find agents, again, you may have an entire session on this, so I don't want to go over anything in too much detail. But the two places that I generally tend to recommend to look, the Writers and Artists Yearbook is a comprehensive directory it's published annually and it has all the UK based agents in it and publishers with lots of information plus loads of uh, handy articles. Um, a reference copy usually available in central libraries and you can buy previous years ones because it is quite expensive. And the Association of Authors Agents, the AAA, also has an online directory. So not every agency will be on there, but it is basically a, a group, a member group for agents and they have you know policies that all members adhere to um, there's that additional safeguard 
um, which is quite nice, you know, that if they're all part of this membership organisation, they're upholding the tenets of that, of that membership group. So they have an online. Um, and then this is a little addendum, really, um, before we move on to questions. Um, because, you, you know, we're talking about preparing your manuscript for publication. We can do that with the best will and hope in the world. But rejection does happen. And so I thought it was quite important to have a little bit here about dealing with rejection. Um, and we look at this in the in the TLC being a writer program as well. We've got a whole podcast on it. So we've got here two anonymized sets of statistics from agents that I've been in contact with who I've asked to share with me anonymously some of their query numbers. Now, before your jaws drop to the floor, I will I will read out the, the statistics and then I will explain why I put them here and I promise it's not to it's not to be a gut punch there is a good reason so this was from a mid-sized agency over one year of submissions this agent that I talked to received 3002 queries to their inbox for, for them of which they requested 74 full manuscripts so I don't actually um, know how many um, so well, you, you can work out the ratio there. Of those 3,002 queries, some of those would have been passed on to colleagues, but this particular agent requested 74 of those, 3,002, for full manuscripts. And of those, they signed three new clients. A second agent I asked uh, was a, a senior agent, an independent called boutique agency. This is again across one year of submissions. They received over 4,000 queries. They're quite high profile, this person. Um, they didn't share with me how many full manuscripts they requested of those, but they did disclose that they had signed six new clients. So, oh, let me skip back. I'm, again, I'm, I'm not sharing these to dishearten you. Um, I know it sounds disheartening, but I also think what is quite interesting, especially in that first example, is that sometimes we have clients come to TLC and they feel a bit disheartened because they've had some people request their full manuscripts but they haven't quite got anywhere. Now I'll go back to this one because really 74 of 3002 to be requesting a full manuscript. If you get a full manuscript request you're already several steps ahead so please never ever feel bad if you get a full manuscript request and it doesn't turn into an offer of representation you haven't failed. It's a fiercely competitive environment. I think far too competitive. And I, uh, again, there's a whole other session I could, I could, uh, I could do on that, but I won't. Um, it's a very, very difficult environment, and I think it's extremely important. Um, this is why, whenever I do these sessions, I try and include something on kind of understanding to. Be, to that you need to be prepared for rejection, but you need to also ask yourself, before you send your book into the world, please, please ask yourself these questions. And I have a whole workshop that I do on finding purpose and motivation for writers, which starts here. And actually, I start with a different quote. I start with a quote that I haven't got here, but it's, um, are you writing as a means to an end or as a means to truth? That's, um, that's the thing that I ask people. And I ask them, and I will ask you too, in your own time, to just answer these two questions for me. The first question, what does success look like to you? In general, for you and your life, what does success look like? What does it really look like? You could draw a picture, you could do whatever. So in your own time, please have a think about that and actually answer that question if you can. And the second question, what does success mean for this book? For this book in your hands that you're currently writing, that you're getting ready, what are you getting it ready for? And I mean, we're in a we're in a session here about publication. So perhaps all of you are thinking, well, obviously I want a publishing deal. But but sometimes when you sit down and you think, actually, what do I want success to look like for this book? You begin to break down what you actually want, what you're actually aiming for. And it's so important to have a good understanding of whether I want a big advance and that's totally legitimate it's totally fine to think actually what I want is an advance that allows me to live off my writing another perfectly legitimate response I want to find sympathetic readers for this book that it feels like a little bit of a misfit but that I'm really proud of that's fine as well I want recognition because I feel like I want recognition I want validation 
really try in concrete terms to answer what success means like for this, what means what success means for this book, and try and why I'm saying this is to try and break away from what the media might tell you you need or what we as an industry might feed you as success. How far is that really your dream? And your pre-submission checklist to end on is exactly the same as the pre the editing checklist. Before you submit, before you send your book out into the world, wherever it's going to, whoever it's going to, having some self-awareness, who you are, what you want, what success looks like. Because if you know what success actually looks like for you in this book, you have a much better chance of achieving it. Just, I want, I think, maybe to be published. It doesn't really work. It's not a concrete enough goal. You will always feel like you're failing if you have a grand but vague plan. And, and feeling like you're failing is horrible. It's not good for your mental health. So having some self-awareness, having that resilience, and knowing that you do have that resilience despite the, the, the setbacks, um, and also knowing your parameters, knowing your parameters, so knowing how many people you want to submit to before you decide you have a break, how many submit to people to, to submit to at any one time. You know, if you feel a bit fragile, don't send to 50 people and risk 50 rejections. Send to five to 10 agents instead. Some objectivity, kindness, discipline, and all of this, whether you're editing, writing, or submitting for publication, all of this is your strategy. So hang on to your strategy. And that's me done. This is me at Aki Schiltz on Twitter, at TLC UK. We are the literary consultancy, www.literaryconsultancy.co.uk. I am going to stop talking, stop sharing, and hopefully, hopefully we have some questions. Thank you, Aki. That was great. Can I just ask a very quick question? Yeah, of course. If that's all right. Um, you did a wonderful near mic drop quote quite early doors, and we just want to make sure we've got it because it was brilliant. You said something like, no one picks up a Stradivarius and expects to be a violinist, <laughs> but people pick up a pen and expect to be a writer. Can you just give us that one more time so we've got it? Because it was amazing, but I couldn't write it down quick enough. I was too kind of I, dumbstruck yeah, by it. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think you might have added the Stradivarius, but I said violin, oh, certainly. Oh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But, you know. Give it to me as you said it, please. That'd be great. Um, I think it's that. I think it was exactly that, that, you know, nobody picks up a violin expecting to be a virtuoso. But people, ah, there, we okay. there we go, people pick up a pen and expect to just be a writer. And I mean that in a positive way, because, you know, we, we're too hard on ourselves, I think, assuming that we've kind of, we've got to have it all ready, and, and it might not be. How do we do this? Um, <laughs> how do we do the, the, the chat thing here now? The question. Uh, so if delegates are obviously as we've been doing for a lot of the sessions now if they're happy to put their questions into the chat box um the moderators and i will will pick them up there and are send a few oh lovely thank you Jess. there are a few that have been coming through so i'll just start reading them out if that's okay I, yeah of course of course apologies if i don't i'm going to try and go back because um we've got people start adding with questions so if i miss the first one <laughs> i apologize um what so a couple of questions here uh, what are the word counts for children? What age groups would you split this area into? Oh, OK. So um, I'm not a children's fiction expert. I know that the author Louis Stowell, L-O-U, I will write her name to the chat. Hang on. Louis Stowell, um, I've just written her name there, has prepared a kind of, she has an infographic, which has all of the different age categories and, um, and the word lengths. Uh, I do know generally, however, that say adult fiction, you're expecting 80 to 120,000 words, sounds about right for an adult fiction novel. Young adults, nearer the 60,000 word mark. Middle grade, nearer the 40,000 word mark. And then children's would be sort of lower than that. But but within the actual children's categories, there's sort of, you know, early learning, early reader books, um, picture books, chapter books, three to five. Um, 8 to 11, 5 to 7, there's all of these different categories, but it's worth having a Google because um, in the UK, I think those are lined up with curriculum, um, but there are resources online where you can get information about those. They can be quite strict, so worth looking up and worth knowing. 
uh, just going down now for the there was another fairly simple one um, minimum word count for mem oh <laughs> it scrolls down too quickly there was one asking for the equivalent for a novel um, word counts for re recommended word counts for novels yeah 80 to 120,000 yeah. ish um, if they're slightly shorter that's fine slightly longer starts to get a bit concerning publishers don't tend to like anything over 120,000 there are always exceptions but they tend to be those kind of singular mold breaking ones uh, question was uh, sorry just did you, did you say, did you say for, did you say for memoir as well just then there was once somebody asking for memoir as well yeah so <clears throat> Memoir, actually, recently there have been some interesting memoirs that have come out really short. And they're kind of those lyrical style, sort of 60,000 wordish ones. That still feels quite short to me, but probably 60 to 90,000, they tend to run a little bit shorter than novels. Uh, is it possible to propose a work of memoir creative nonfiction rather than a finished manuscript? Um, rather than a finished manuscript oh, what I do you... yeah I, I'm, I don't I'm really get the question so Tracy, okay if you, fine. Mind, if you wouldn't mind elaborating that I'm not entirely sure do, do you mean a do proposal you... for a memoir ah okay so proposals in non-fiction are interesting we, we just yeah. hosted a, a seminar on this actually at TLC um with Joella Wusu Sakiri of Coronet she's commissioning non-fiction ed editor um so with memoir falls into creative nonfiction, which tends to be pitched in the same way as fiction, which means that those the memoir tends to be submitted um, complete. Nonfiction that's submitted on what's called a partial tends to be um, something that's technical or that's, you know, so, so say a scientist has been, been approached to write something about their field of expertise. They quickly draw up three sample chapters plus a proposal which says, and this is what the other chapters would look like, and here's my market um, comparison titles and, and a bit of a bit of that. That would be a proposal where something's on partial. But, me but memoir tends not to be, um, tends to be complete before it's submitted. Um, question, could you elaborate on the why this book, why now, why you, i.e. an example of what you might say here, thanks. <laughs> yeah absolutely so um let's have a think okay so it's a so say it's a novel and it's based in i don't know a particular part of italy in the 1800s and you say you know based on uh well I, I, the centenary of this event is coming up and um i happen to have researched it and blah 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 if there's a tie if there's an obvious tie in mention it but why you might be because you have experience in a particular field because you've got um you know you spent a long time background researching it uh, it might be something that peripherally you've got another um maybe it's a, a research area for you or um something related to a different platform that you're on um, just basically show that it's topical, that it's relevant, that it's relevant. Topical is a loaded word, so I take that back. Make sure that it feels relevant and that you've got a good enough reason to be writing it. I think especially also today, uh, at the moment, um, there's a lot of contention around, we won't get into it, but there's a lot of contention around sort of own voices stories. So publishers are really keen to hear from, you know, as many kind of people from diverse backgrounds as possible, wonderfully. More cynically, um, they are also loading the emotional labour onto these writers to write only own voices stories, which can be quite problematic. So I just um, just try and kind of pitch yourself authentically um, is, is all I can say there, as with any piece of work. Um, just scrolling through a couple more questions. Uh, of, again, as people tap a glossary, right. How important are comps of other books, films you think are similar to pitches? Oh, okay, so comp titles are comparison titles. So, you know, this book is, I don't know, Girl A meets Little Women or, or whatever it is. Um, I have spoken to a lot of agents about this and uh, people either love them or hate them. I have a couple more on the love side, I have to say, than on the hate side. I think they're quite useful, but um, with comparison titles, the thing to remember is use contemporary comparison titles that show you're aware of the market as it is today in the area that you're writing. So if you've got a comparison title, which is this is a similar field of work to mine, or 
tonally or with voice this author is similar to mine it just shows that you've got a good handle on what's currently being published and is currently selling so if you can use them just don't make them you know Shakespeare meets I don't know Dan Brown or something <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to read that book. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was a bit rude. Um, so Curtis Brown, Edison and Pitch Course said only to resubmit if you had radically altered. I'm just, uh, by the way, there's been loads of comments saying thank you very much sure. and just how great the, the presentation oh, was. Good. Um, you said something about um, pitching and resubmitting. Curtis Brown, Edit and Pitch Call said only to resubmit if you had radically altered. Yeah. Um, okay, so resubmission is difficult. So I think in, ca in case anybody in the chat thinking, what are we talking about? If you submit to an agent and you alter your, you edit your work and you want to resubmit to them, should you? I've talked to agents about this and they're almost unanimous. The answer is unless you have, you've been asked to resubmit that book by the agent, don't do it. Um, it might be that, you know, five years down the line, it hasn't gone out uh, on, on submission anywhere else. It hasn't, you know, done the rounds with editors and been rejected. Um, it's still there and you, and you think, oh, I have changed it and it's been five years since I submitted to this person and they never got back to me. Maybe I'll submit again. Possibly you could then. But it's, it tends to be that, you know, they've said no for a reason. Um, they've taken the time to look at it, especially if they've given you any feedback or, or requested the full manuscript. Tend, you tend not to be able to resubmit. If they said to you, I'd love to see what else you've written, send, you know, don't forget to send to them. Um, a comment from Andy, many agents reply with the standard, I'm sure you will be welcome elsewhere, fair enough. Many just don't reply at all, ever. I don't find that acceptable, to be honest, however many queries they get, but there you go. Uh, that I've had so many meetings with agents where they just, well, yeah, they get thousands, they can get hundreds or even thousands of submissions. It's it's really galling. I've been on the receiving end myself, but you, m my personal recommendation is always move on to the next person. <laughs> Actually, that's what I've always done with my books. But um, question, yeah, do you, you can... recommend, oh, sorry. Sorry, no, I was going to say, you can actually, if you want to, um, I, I've done this with, with poetry, I'm a poet, so I did this poetry submission. Have a spreadsheet, track the date that you're submitting to certain people, make a note in the spreadsheet of what they say on their website. So if they say on their website, if you haven't heard from us within 12 weeks, it's a no. On that same spreadsheet, next to the date of submission, mark the date 12 weeks to the day after that one. If you haven't heard, mark no. Um, and with others, uh, check the website, see if they have a submission timeline. And, and then if they haven't said anything on the website, it's fine to tr to kind of, you know, after say eight to 10 weeks, give them a polite nudge. But track what you're doing. And again, if you want to send five to 10 at a time, that's quite manageable. Um, and then you've it's got a timeline, you can keep things ticking along. Sorry, Jason, I interrupted no, you. No, 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 not at all. There another couple of questions. Do you recommend literary competitions to get your work noticed? Yes, I do. Um, I am actually, um, so we're, we're an industry partner for the Bridport Prize, and I'm lucky enough to be one of the shortlist judges for the First Novel Award. And consistently, people do get picked up. Agents do take notice. Um, again, though, <laughs> back to my spreadsheet idea, um, each of them will have a fee. Now, people feel, you know, funny about fees. I, I know how much work goes and how much money goes into running a prize. You have to pay your judges, you have to pay readers, especially if you get thousands of submissions. You have web hosting, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. You've got lots of cost behind it. So um, I think as long as there's a bursary quota for low-income writers, fees are tend to be justified. However, um, you can track and have a budget, set a budget for the year, how much you're willing to pay on prizes and competitions, because at, at some point it's not worth the return, especially with bigger ones where your chances are slimmer. But, you know, submit to a few big ones, a few smaller local ones, new ones. I submitted to a new prize and I won. There weren't that many people entering <laughs> that I can say I'm prize winning. So be a bit savvy, mix it up. But yes, agents do pay attention and they do request the anthologies from the big prizes. And there's another question. How important is it to have a following before submitting, such as popular social media, blogs, etc.? Uh, only if you are hoping to write a kind of non-fiction book about an area that you're an influencer in. Um, 
uh, it can be handy. So I do a whole session on this myself. And the first thing I lead with is be where your readers are. It doesn't make sense for you to be on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and whatever else if the people you're trying to reach are not there. So just think again strategically. A, who, what's my personality like? What am I comfortable with? What can I handle? Of? Where does my expertise lie? If I am willing to, um, and, and I feel my readers would appreciate, uh, say, having a weekly blog, because actually the kind of readers I have would quite like a, a weekly blog, fantastic. Get loads of subscribers in your blog. If my readers will tend to be on Twitter and it, it makes sense for me to have a presence on Twitter, great. Um, but use it for networking, for community building. Uh, you're not going to sell. There is statistic. There is evidence on this. You're not going to sell off the back of a Twitter following. Um, but it, it, it's visibility, it's connection, it's engagement. So what do you need? What do you want it for? Will it be useful to you? And be where your readers are. That's the most important thing. I. I think that that's, oh no, uh, some competitions ask for a bio. If you're new to writing, how should this be approached? Um, I'll just say, folks, we, we've got to five o'clock, so I'll take this as the last question, but thank you very much, everyone. Do, um, also, Jason, I'm very happy for you to share the chat text with me and I can go through any questions unanswered. Okay, brilliant. Sorry, bios, did you say? How do you, if you've got, if you've uh, got yeah, no profile? Write a, bio. a competition asks for a bio. If you're new to writing, how should this be approached? Um, keep it short and sweet, sort of 50 to 100 words. They're just wanting a summary of you. And also, if it is a competition, it might be that they think, should you be long or shortlisted, they would need something ready to go and upload to the site. If there's nothing writing related, that's fine. If there is anything writing related, put it in there because it's the most relevant version of a bio. In the same way that when you're writing a CV, you would tailor it to the place that you're applying to. Um, so act the same way with your bio. Any, any kind of courses that you've been on, prizes that you've been listed for, mentioned those there, anything that you're part of, membership groups, subscriber to the bookseller, part of the Society of Young Publishers, part of writing East Midlands, whatever it is, mention it. But otherwise, don't worry, don't worry. Thank you very much. And let's people offering their thanks. Great session, amazing session. Yeah, really good. Thank you. Fantastic session. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, just uh, to echo what's been said, uh, thank you to everyone who's attended today. It is the social session tonight, so you've got the night off technically, but if you want to get in touch and get the digital delegates list from me, you're more than welcome, and we'll see you tomorrow. And just to add very quickly to that thing about bios, uh, something I find very handy, because I'm a little bit lazy, is having a 30-word version, a 50-word version, and a 100-word version you prepare ahead of time, so you can just copy-paste them across depending on uh, who and who and how and when people want them. So there's a helpful little bit of a, a time-saving technique for you there. Uh, yeah, if you want the de digital delegates list, do email me tonight, and I'll pass it on uh, as the emails come in. But again, just uh, again to say thank you again to Aki for an incredible session. I've been swooning in my chair at some of the stuff you've given us, and it's been amazing. So thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.